Max, the one to watch for the best in entertainment, now has live sports with the Bleacher Report sports add-on. Stream hundreds of select live games from MLB. That's gonna go! Gone. NBA, NHL, U.S. Soccer, and NCAA Men's March Madness. We just see what we think we just saw. And it's all included for a limited time with any Max subscription. He got it. After the promo period, add it for $9.99 a month. Base subscription required. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Need a holiday gift that will keep her sparkling all year long? Right now, Blue Nile, the original online jeweler, is offering 30% off select jewelry. With experts on hand 24-7 to provide guidance, you're sure to find the perfect piece. And now there's even more to love about shopping at BlueNile.com. For a limited time, get 36-month special financing on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com. City of Chronicles is a Bayer Chronicles production. <laughs> Seria Chronicles podcast. Happy Halloween from the Seria Chronicles podcast. It was all trick for Roma and Juventus this weekend, but we got some treats from Napoli and Milan at the top of the table. They are going so, so strong. We have a special episode for you this week. We've got, as always, myself and Mina Rizuki. We've also got our own Halloween treat coming to us live from the future, by the way, because we're recording on Halloween, Mina and I, but it's already the 1st of November in Australia. We have Mark Bosnich with us as well. Mark, how are you and how much are you enjoying this Serie A season? Uh, Nikki, uh, very, very well. And hello to Mina and also to Simon as well, who's listening in uh, from Perth. And thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. Sorry, actually, Mike, can I redo that? Because I didn't say who Mark is. Like, no, I, no. I, I, didn't, I didn't point out, in case any of our audience don't know, that Mark is an Australia international with, I haven't got your caps number in front of me, lots of caps in your past. You played for Manchester United for um, a season. You played for Aston Villa for heaps of seasons. You were a world-class footballer. You're now a world-class broadcaster. We're so excited to have you with us. Well, I, yes. like, I, like I just said, thank, and that's an even better one. That was like <laughs> icing on the cake. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, and, and like I said to you as well, uh, here in Australia, it's, a, it's already uh, past Halloween. But uh, in terms of the question, how are we enjoying Serie A? Um, look, I, I really think, especially after Italy's victory in the Euros, um, that uh, Serie A is really basking in sunlight at the moment um, in terms of uh, the quality of football, um, you know, the, the variety in terms of the way that the table's going, the fact that, you know, a great side in Juventus are already, what, 16 points uh, off the top of the table, um, which for Juventus supporters won't be good, but for, for all other neutrals, we'll, we'll sort of, it makes it a little bit interesting. And, and the general play, as we've seen from all teams, um, you know, we'll speak about them, especially... AC Milan, um, you know, that opening game in the Champions League that, that, that we covered against Liverpool, we saw their qualities uh, and the way that they've started you know, to go on a seven game uh, winning streak and to win 10 out of their first 11. That's sort of it's history breaking at the moment. And, and hopefully it can continue. Uh, Napoli, obviously, top of the table, have been absolutely fantastic. Um, Mourinho's back, which adds its certain spice as well. And, and we'll talk about as well some of the other teams, Atalanta. Um, but it's as open as Serie A, a race that I can remember in, in quite some time. It really, really is. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, Mina, I think the place that we have to start is with a team who seem not to be part of that race this season, who seem to be running their own 
sad race of of how far behind they can fall at the moment at uh, Juventus. Since our last show, they lost to Sassuolo and then they lost this weekend to Verona. Now, we, we love Verona. We've given lots of praise to Verona, even just on our last edition of the podcast. But Mina, Mina, is it over already? Are you then out of the title race? I mean, it's funny listening to Mark because, Mark, one thing that you said so accurately is that it's so exciting in Serie A right now because it's not UV. And, and that's great for everyone else, but not for the UV fan. And I'm holding my hand up because I'm a UV fan. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... <laughs> This is um, difficult to deal with, I've got to say, because I genuinely believed it was a rough start. I thought that once they get the fundamentals on track, that they will find a way through. And they were doing so well. Um, Not so well, but they were at least keeping clean sheets, managing 1-0 victories, what, four in a row, winning in the Champions League. And I was like, okay, this, this can get better. You know, obviously there were lots of absences. Once Morata comes in, once Dybala comes in, once Kies is, you know, fully like geared in, just been really frankly a disaster. And I don't know what to say other than the fact that the team has no identity. I'm not entirely sure what it is that Elegri is trying to do. And yet I don't feel like he deserves the blame for all of this, but I don't know where to put it. I don't know whether it's a question of timing. I don't. I think it would be much better in this world if if Rabio perhaps missed a few games for you, babe, <laughs> you know, or, or, or in the oh nicest goodness. sense. Because I mean, I know he's not a bad player. It just doesn't seem to. Work. It's so hard to be polite about that. <laughs> And it really is, you know, but I I do think it's a little bit strange where Rabio was so heavily criticised when he played for France against yeah. Switzerland and they lost that match on penalties. And uh, Rabia was playing on the wing, right? And it's almost like Deshaun called Allegri and was like, you know what, why don't you do this? Because for sure you'll get the best out of Rabio, even though we didn't, you know? And it's like you're playing him in this really bizarre formation that doesn't get the best out of anyone here. And Rabio especially. And I, I don't know whether it's bizarre how much Danilo's gone back. I don't know whether there's a need to simplify the tactics, but the tactics are already so simple. So I don't know whether it's too rigid for some of these players to understand or are they like these better with older players who sort of know what to do in their own way and he's not very clued up on how to develop somebody like Rabio. I, I, I don't know where to put the blame. But right now, the way that I'm looking at it is that it's a team that doesn't have much balance it has an awful midfield that was always going to be exposed right now they're playing without a number nine uh, I don't know what I'm Alvaro Morat is doing and I always stick up for him but he cannot be your main guy because he's never done that very well when he did do very well at Juventus he was doing so alongside Carlitos Tevez um, and so he needs to have someone off him and last season when he was good it was off Ronaldo right now I just feel like there needs to be a central focal point so there needs to be better midfielders and I don't know. What do you think, Mark? Well, I think you make some excellent points. Um, I watched them in their 3-2 victory against Sampdoria. And, and uh, although I was quite Im- impressed w- with the way that they were playing, uh, there were obvious, obviously little links that were, were, weren't quite as strong as they have been in the past. That day when they played, and that was right before they played the Chelsea game, and I'll get onto the Chelsea game in, in a little bit, Dybala and, and, uh, and Murata actually came off both injured. The midfield that day a little bit different to what we have. I mean, the yeah. midfield that day they they basically played Locatelli, Bentancur, Bernadeschi, and Chiesa, who who seemed to work quite well together. Even though Chiesa was joining up quite a lot of times up the front, but he would still come back and do his defensive work. But it just didn't seem quite right. Now the the Chelsea game then uh, in the Champions League really warmed my heart in terms of from a Juventus perspective because I thought they they had a clear plan that night. It was obvious that that uh, Allegri had decided that Chelsea, in his opinion, were were sort of the better team in terms of if they went uh, uh, name for name on the team sheet, and he was happy just to sit back um, in in you could say in, in a traditional way that Juventus would have done in the past, and it was a really exciting win, and I thought that that would really 
uh, catapult them uh, in terms of their league form. But the the last two games, like you said, they, they've mixed the match with the midfield. And I'm I'm from an outside perspective watching. That's why I thought you were absolutely spot on. It, it's it's not a real clear plan exactly what they're trying to do. And I think Allegri's caught in between that. You know, everyone wants this these days, the clear plan and a philosophy and a way of playing. But the bottom line is that there are teams and very good teams, and we've seen that with Manchester United, that have players that really can't play that certain type of football that everybody wants to see. And I think there's where the confusion comes in. Uh, and you've also got managers who are used to playing in a certain way, um, but they realise that that type of way of playing uh, and winning is is not as satisfying as it is, say, for a Manchester City um, or, or you know someone like like a Liverpool. What AC Milan are doing right now as well, even Napoli, you could, you could say. And what will happen? And as you've seen it with Juventus, and it's and it's like this is similar with Manchester United. And you saw what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer did on the weekend. He just turned around and said, "Look, that's enough's enough. I'm going to lose my job here. I'm going to go with three centre backs." We're going to be solid and we're going to play like an away team, whether we're home or away. And I think Allegri will come to that conclusion as well, because basically now you, you have to say, I mean, I think it's it's 16 or 15 points that they're off the top of the table. It's it's a real long shot for them to turn around and say they've got a chance in the league. But in my opinion, they still have a chance in the Champions League. Um, but that's where it could become really disastrous if they start struggling in the Champions League. At least they will have this season, in my opinion in the league especially, um, to make sure that he gets a system uh, or two or three systems that the players not only are comfortable with, but what they can do. This is the fascinating thing, um, actually, because what you're saying, Mark, about maybe you just need to learn to play the away team. I think Allegri has been trying to play like mm. the away team, and I think that is fine <laughs> as long as Problem. Juventus were doing the thing which he referred to winning a corto muso, which means, you know, by a short head, basically, mm. in, in horse racing. It's a horse racing term that he's borrowed. That was fine when they, they went on a game run of, was it six games in a row they won? Um, and, like, most mm-hmm. of them were 1-0. Yeah, it's fine as long as you keep winning your races by a short head. But if you don't win them anymore, then you end up suddenly with, with nothing to show for it. And I, I you know, I'm going to be honest, Nina, I, I want to push back a little bit on you because... I think both of us have been big Max Allegri fans, right? Like both of us have been big Max Allegri uh, 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 apologists. I don't know if that's the right word, but people who both think he's, he's a good manager and he's look, he's got a great track record. I also think it's worth saying in lots of Max Allegri seasons, you can actually look at Juventus when he was there. And so they muddled along for a while. And then about halfway through the season, he found his plan and he ran with it to the end of the season. So maybe he just hasn't found that plan yet, but I'm really struggling with this 4-4-2. You'll put Rabio on the wing. He's not a winger. I don't know if he should be playing anywhere else, but he definitely shouldn't be playing on the left wing. And the plan seems to be get the ball to Paolo Dybala and he'll fix it, which sometimes he can do for you, but it's not much of a plan. And what's funny is actually with Boz, um, we were, I was, I joined um, Mark on, uh, on Stan Sports, which is the Australian Champions League broadcaster. And we did the Juventus-Chelsea game together for Mm. the coverage. And in that game, he did do something that I thought was clever. He did the um, Kiers ahead of Bernadez. He played, uh, sorry, Bernadez ahead of Kiers. He did the false nine system. It worked. It was something that was different. But this last few games, I don't get it at all. And I think it's his fault. Okay, but... Here it is. What What is it that I said that made you think that I was pro Allegri? Because I said that <laughs> Rabiot was doing what Jacques Deschamps... Sometimes, Nikki, I'm starting to think you're not listening to me when I was... I was listening to you. I felt like you tried to deflect the blame from uh, Allegri to Rabiot, whereas it's Allegri's fault that Rabiot is playing on the left wing. Yes, no, okay, I agree with you. And also this whole thing of waiting until, what, the 57th minute to make a substitution, this really bothers me about Allegri, is that I, he plays one game for 70 minutes and another game for the last 20 minutes, mm-hmm. and he's done that pretty much all the time. And it was something that I especially had an issue with in the Champions League final against Real Madrid because it was clear they needed to make changes as soon as Zidane had made his changes, which was at the beginning of the second half. And yet again, we see him sit there and watch while it's a joke of a, of a game being played out in front of him and none of the substitutions and no changes are being made. It was clear that Alexandro was on his own. There was no overlap. There was no help from Rabio. I don't know what on earth was going there. And 
Arthur or Artur is just not ready yet to be somebody that can take that position. Can somebody please tell me as well as what, what is Benton Core doing? I mean, Allegri is in charge with giving instructions, clear instructions to these players to understand what they're doing, to simplify the game for them so they understand how to receive, how to offer an outlet for the pass, how to close down passing lanes. But there seems to be little to no tech, tactical understanding or discipline or positioning or ideas. And it, it is, like you said, it is give it to Dybala. And, and you know, there's a saying in, in Real Madrid, which is uh, they have Hala Madrid, and there's another one that's give it to Benzema, inshallah, which means that they just hope that he'll resolve everything for them. <laughs> And it, it, it remind it, it is kind of the same with Dybala. Um, I thought the Gazetta brought up a wonderful thing in the sense that they said the whole team is right-footed. And I just thought, oh God, I didn't even think about that. It's true. The whole team is right-footed. So not a single, you know, left footer in there. Not a single understanding on how to, you, you know, even when you look at somebody like Lazovic, who had so clearly defined instructions on what he was supposed to do for, for Elas Verona. And then you compare that with somebody as well like Tamezi who understands his role, who keeps it simple, who perfect passes, perfect understanding of space, perfect awareness of what was going around him and knows exactly I'm here to, to play as a defensive pivot, but I keep things clean and, and clear. And so it likely is a fault because so far we're 11 day, you know, where this is the 11th game of the season. If anything, Juventus look worse than they did in the very beginning. So he has to take the blame. He has to understand how to make better substitutions and frankly speaking, you know, I'm not one of those people who thinks you need a philosophy and better attacking play. No, if you are going to play this style of football, that's fine by me. It's not like Conte was wowing me at any stage of the season. But at least win. That's what we're asking. Or do something that's better than hideous, hideous results against Igor Tudor, who's a student of the game. And you're supposed to be the master. Just win, baby. That's the Juventus philosophy. It's, it's all that is supposed to matter <laughs> is the winning I think Nikki Mina makes a, a very she makes a very good point, and and it's a common theme with a lot of these so called bigger clubs. And I'll just go off my experience at being at the bigger clubs. Very very rarely would a you know say a Sir Alex Ferguson or Claudio Ranieri or, or or some of the managers like Ron Atkinson I had at Aston Villa. Very rarely would they say, to, especially to the front players. And remember, this is a different different time. But this you know very rarely would they say, this is what I want you to do. Uh, when we get into the final third, I want you to go here. Normally, they just leave it to him. And it, at bigger clubs, there is that feeling that that's all you have to do. This, this is why we're playing the big money for these players, because they are very, very special. But I think, as you can see, as time goes on, and a lot of these lesser teams are showing up, um, you know, let's, let's look at the Ver Verona example. They're showing up, the so-called bigger teams, because they know from a tactical perspective, they have to be absolutely spot on if they're going to get anything out of those games, and what and what it's doing is starting to show up. So, I mean, I mean, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's had had its had his problems recently with very very similar stories, and I think the realization is coming. And especially with the new generation of player, even the ones in in the attacking third, they do need instruction so we can create time and space for our best player. And I think what you'll find is, and, and this is because of the generation of player as well. They are very reluctant to actually bring these points up to the managers because they're a little bit afraid that they, that basically that the manager might take it out of them and leave them out in the team. So what you have is then a sort of a little bit of a Mexican standoff, if you like. Um, results aren't going well. No one's saying anything. And at the end of the day, the manager is the one who's going to pay, pay with his job. But I, I do believe that, like I said, as the game is going forward, and we've seen that, uh, Pep Guardiola comes to mind, Jurgen Klopp, you know, we don't have to talk about minute details for the players so that, you know, so they're thinking too much during the game and all of a sudden you see confusion. But just the way that basically you can say, like, okay, look, we want to create time and space for Dybala. How are we going to do that? Okay, well, you know, this is what we're going to do. When we get the ball down this side, now, another great example is Gasparini, what he's done with Atalanta. That's a wonderful example to, to basically back up what I'm just saying. You know, you can say Atalanta in the last two or three seasons have, have been absolutely not only fantastic to watch, but have come up with some absolutely tremendous results. I mean, beating Liverpool at Anfield, they should have beat Manchester United, really, 2-0 up. Uh, and the success that he's had with what is basically a provincial side, and it's really been down to the fact that two things, in my opinion, he's been very, very clear with his instructions of, of how he wants everyone to play, uh, and, and it hasn't complicated things. And the other thing as well, attractive football. Attractive football, um, for me, is less of a risk now 
than defensive football. I mean, because, you know, Mina was saying, you know, as long as we win, we well, remember only one team can win in every league. So I think it's actually very risky for a coach these days to play that type of football, to look for those one nil wins, because if it goes the other way and you don't, and you don't win, which you know is highly likely, people are going to say, what am I turning up for this game for? You know, you know, I'm turning up here. I, I want to be entertained and I'm getting crap football. And not only that, we're not winning as well. So I really do think, and the manager does set the tone. And I know they get blamed all the time, but they do set the tone. And I really do think, I mean, one little good point, I think it was either you, Nicky, or Amina who brought it up, one of you two brought it up, was the last time he was there, took him around about till Christmas until he really found the way. Well, Christmas is coming up in a month and a half's time. And like I said, the title, you could pretty much say, 16 points behind at this stage, is is pretty much gone. So he's got to come up with that very, very quick smart um, because I saw the reaction of Nedved where they can see the second goal. And it wasn't encouraging. And we all know that there was talk beforehand that, you know, there were rumours that not everybody was was on board uh, with getting Allegri back. So uh, when you start seeing that, you know, from, from people who are above... Believe me, I, I mean, nobody's on board with Nedved, including senior management. I mean, if it was up to us, I'd rather he walked out the door from the beginning because I blame all of these last three seasons a lot on him, to be frank with you. I mean, I, I understand that Allegri is not there, but Nedved and his reactions are the or a scourge on the reputation of Juventus. <laughs> it just doesn't look good. Yeah, and I'm just thinking there's there's something not quite right here, uh, you know, and it shouldn't be at a club of that stature, put it that way. Yeah. I, I definitely think there's a whole can of worms here when it comes to Nedford, and I, I saw Mina, I saw Mina before she even uh, chipped in on that. I, I, I you know, <laughs> for sure, that whole directorial situation is fascinating. I mean, we, we were talking about in the summer whether or not Agnelli would survive what happened with the Super League. And in the end, Paratici left and Agnelli stayed and Nedvi had stayed. And, and I think, um, yeah, those reactions. He does make himself very visible for someone who's not directly involved with the the, the management of the, the, the team in, in what's going on the pitch anyway at that moment in time. I feel like we could be here for a really long time talking about events. And we, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but we've got a lot of things to get through in this show. So let's not just sit here i also don't want to move on from this game without at least giving another shout out to giovanni simeone who scored two more goals we talked about him on the last show we talked about how it all started with him you you weren't here with us mark we we talked about how giovanni simeone had apparently been working out all through his honeymoon this summer he didn't take any time off he worked all the way through it now the latest news that we've got from his uh, post-game quotes is he's been watching rocky movies he watched Rocky one before he scored two goals against La- before he scored four goals against Lazio, and he watched Rocky two before scoring two goals against Juventus. So I don't know what to say about this guy. He's he's absolutely on fire at the moment. <laughs> Sono già due in 13 minuti e mezzo per Simeone, sono otto in campionato e questo è uno dei più belli in assoluto, 2 a 0 per l'Ellas. Lo stato di grazia di I know his dad Diego Simeone is worthy proud of him and said after the Lazio game that that was the best game he'd ever seen him play. So Aww. can't can't not be um impressed by what he's done. I think it's eight goals in nine games a season, which given he only scored six all of last season, is quite something. In fact, I've got a... And much of that is to Caprari yes. as well. Caprari, I, I think, deserves a mention as well for how much he benefits him. I think this has been a lovely, meaty first section talking about Juventus. And um, I think we will take a break here and then we will come back with some more chat in section two. Mark. While we've got you here, let's have a quick chat about uh, the Champions League and Europa League situation for the Italian teams. I know you have been covering all of them uh, over with Stan Sports. Yep. Progress so far. I feel like it's a really mixed outlook for the Italian teams. And what's funny about it is it does not equal up at all with the league positions. So, for instance, um, Well, we've got Juventus, we were talking about, have they got a shot still in the league? I feel like they're in a very comfortable position now in in the group, having won three out of three and going into that uh, um, game at home to Zenit. Whereas Milan are in completely the opposite position, top of Serie A, but no points 
Is it as simple as saying Juventus are through, Milan are out? Or is there more to it, do you think, so than that? I, I definitely think there's more to it than that. I mean, let's start with AC Milan. I mean, you know, we, we did that first game, Nicky, um, against Liverpool. And, and mm. really, you know, th- there was an opportunity there, you know, when they got right back into the game. I know when they got to 2-1, where they had a real big opportunity to score and they didn't. And I think it was just a bit of lack of experience on their part and more experience on Liverpool, which led them to the defeat. But I was so encouraged of what I saw. There are so many AC Milan fans here in Australia. And the general consensus was from everyone. They were, they were so happy, um, obviously not only to see them back in the Champions League, but what they saw that day. And we all know about the game against Atletico Madrid. I, I very rarely use like strong words in, in terms against officials, but... I really do think, let's put it this way, they were truly hard done by. Porto game is one that, they, that they've got an opportunity to put right now. You know, that, that, that was a game I would have thought that they would have been counting uh, on, on the three points, but they didn't get. But I still don't think that they're out just yet. I, I, I believe that Liverpool will beat Atletico and I believe that AC Milan will, will win, which will put them basically one point behind both Porto and Atletico with having to play them both once again. Uh, and in the form that they're in, um, Pioli's men, I, I wouldn't put it past them to come into second place, minimum third place. I think that's important for them. In terms of Juventus, you're right. It's it's ironic, but it just goes to show how important those, I mean, in the league, you call them six-pointers, but in the Champions League, I guess you call them mini fi- mini finals in the group stages, how important that win was uh, a- against Chelsea. Because the way the league is going, um, if they were struggling in the Champions League, I really do think we'd be talking about possibilities for a new manager um, but a win for them like you said again Zenit and uh, and they should be absolutely fine uh, Inter Milan look they're in that uh, really really strange group with uh, for me one of the stories of the season in Sharif um, with that amazing result they had at the Bernabeu um, but some big game big game coming up for them as well you know after after like I said to you because of the Real Madrid, Madrid result um, so they've got Sharif away. Like I said, the way that the Sharif have been playing and they're, they're like seem on a high, it's going to be so, so difficult for them. And of course, the last one is Atalanta. Th- this is, for me, is going to be the tightest of groups. And this is a huge game uh, in Bergamo that's going to be on Tuesday night. A huge game for Manchester, but also a huge game for Gasparini's men. They obviously got, the Darun got that last minute equaliser on the weekend against Lazio. Um, their form has been a little bit, you could say, indifferent in the league. But you, you you always get the impression with Atalanta, you know, when they hit their straps and, they, and like they did in the first half against Manchester United, they're difficult for any team in the world um, to, to get anything out of. Yeah, I think they're labelled as going to the dentist chair. So from all yes. of those, who is it that you think will reach the farthest from the Italian teams? I mean, we think that Milan potentially could be out quite early on. Well, I, I, no, I, I think Juventus still will. And I know that'll make Mina very, very happy. But I think Juventus will. Because I think what will happen is, like I said, I I think the league, I think Serie A is out of the question for them. Uh, The only thing that they'll be vying for is to to get into that top four. And I think the main focus Mm -hmm. will go on to the Champions League. So I still think that that they they will go furthest out of of the four sides. Look, if if Atalanta happened to get through, and that's a touch and go with, with, you know, with them, with, with... them, Villarreal, Manchester United is going to be touch and go. They're going to be very difficult in a two-legged, two-legged affair with anyone. Ace, like I said, AC Milan are up against it because they're opening three results, but no one will want to meet them. Inter Milan, that's it's you know it's a huge game for them uh, against Sharif. They really need to get something out of that as well. But they've been a little bit of a dark horse uh, in the league. I mean, I was I was looking at I don't know if, if one of you two, Mina or Nikki, tweeted it. Their start is actually comparable to the start they had last season in Serie A. So I think that they're perhaps being a little bit, you know, like I said, yeah, underestimated in what they could do. Um, but that, that's going to be difficult because of the other results actually to get through the group. But any of those Italian sides, if they get into the knockout stages, are going to be very, very difficult. But if I had to choose, I would say Juventus would go furthest. It is. It's so complicated, isn't it? Because Juventus are in the best position I think Milan have played some brilliant mm. football in the Champions League. They were terrible against Porto, but the first two games they played brilliantly and they just lost them. One, because they were playing Liverpool, who are one of the best teams in the world right now, and the second one because they had a, a rough sending off against Atletico that I really think has really critically damaged them in this group. In the Europa League, obviously, we've got Napoli looking like they could go somewhere. Lazio, who knows, under... 
Maurizio Sarri, Roma have their chance to come back against Bodo Glimt after that humiliating night. <laughs> it's it's going to be mm. an interesting round in the Champions League. Dublin's inside the penalty area. This is Saltvet. Somehow kept out by the legs of Bosnich. Villa trying to break, but Saltvet denied by an acrobatic stop from Mark Bosnich in the Villa goal. It was like something you'd see in the circus big top. And probably the sort of save that only the elastic Bosnich could produce. Mark. I want to, while we've got you, quickly ask you, because we did mention the top about how you had this uh, brilliant playing career. You played um, Aston Villa, Manchester United, obviously for the Socceroos. Was there ever a moment when you could have gone to Serie A? Was there ever a moment when that could have happened? Yes, there, yes, there was. And um, and I'm, and I'm uh, now knowing that Mina's such a uh, Juventus fan, she's going to go uh, crazy at me for this one. But I, I had unfinished business at Manchester United. I was at Manchester United as a young kid and I couldn't stay in the country because I couldn't get a work permit. But mm. that, that sorted itself out. And I wanted to go back there and win something, which I did. But during that season, so that was 1998, 99, first and foremost, Roma were very interested. Um, Capello was going to be their new manager. Uh, he'd known me from uh, a game that we played with the Socceroos way back when I was young against AC Milan here in Sydney. So um, I was very, very close. But basically, during that time, Manchester United had made their intentions clear. And I had to, I had to tell basically Rome, I said, look, listen, I'm, I'm most probably going to go back to my old club. However, if you remember that season, uh, Manchester United played Juventus in the semifinals of the Champions League. And remember, the first leg was 1-1. I think Antonio Conte scored in that first leg, um, actually against Manchester United at Old Trafford. Well, the second leg, um, Juventus went up, as you remember, 2-0 and then ended up losing 3-2. Um, but during the game, I was actually flying flying to Turin to speak to Juventus. And I remember before I got onto the plane, thinking to myself, okay, I thought, I thought to myself, and I should have stuck with this. I should have thought the game was on. I thought, right. Whoever loses the game, I reckon I'm going to go to because I'll have something to do next season, yeah? Uh, fully expecting that Manchester United were going to lose. Yeah, but that told me a story in itself. And as I was getting on my plane, my agent at the time rang me and said, Juventus are winning 2-0. So I was like, okay, fair enough. Anyway, we get off the plane at the end of the game uh, and Juventus had sent somebody to pick me, up, pick me up from the airport. And lovely man, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. And, uh, and I remember saying to him, you know, because he could speak English, which was great because my Italian wasn't, wasn't particularly crash hot. I remember saying to him, who won? What was the score? And he started saying, as he's wheeling out my luggage from the airport, he started saying, it was a beautiful game. It was this. And I was like, what was the score? He said, Manchester United come back and won 3-2. <laughs> so I was like, okay, okay, fair enough. So anyway, the, the following day I met with, uh, oh, yeah. with Betigar. Uh, Moji, Geraldo, and who was going to be their new manager, uh, Carlo Ancelotti. And they were very good. They were very nice. And they they, they made it very clear that they, they wanted me to sign. Um, obviously, had my agent there. I also had the interpreter as well. And I just said, look, can I just have the weekend to think about it? Um, so I had the weekend to think about it. And, I, and my, I, I made up my mind. I felt terrible because, I, you know, in hindsight, I should have went. I really should have went because I think it, even from – a personal point of view playing uh, in Italy I think it would have been really good uh in terms of uh, in terms of you know just living in Italy uh, for a good amount of time and the way that they go about things in football I think it would have been it would probably would have been a, a better bet but in the end I went to see Sir Alex on that Sunday and I told him exactly what happened and um and like obviously he was I don't know if he believed me or whatever because I remember you saying who was there you know I said um, I made my mind up to go to Manchester United, but that was, yeah, I, I probably should have, you know, with hindsight, I think it would have been better for the longevity of my career to go to Italy at that stage. We would have loved to have you. I can't believe that. Who says no to Juventus? But it is Alex Ferguson. So I understand that. I would have found it difficult as well. <laughs> it's it's so funny because well, you ended up at Manchester United, obviously you were filling the shoes of Peter Schmeichel, one of the, yeah. the great goalkeepers of all time. Um if you'd gone to Juventus, you could have been the predecessor to Gigi Buffon. You would have been there just before <laughs> he came in. So timing. Well, exactly right. Well, as somebody told me the other day, it, they said, um, I won't say who because you guys will know who it is. I'll, I'll keep his his name. But somebody told me the other day, he said, you know, if you went to Juventus, if you know, if you went to Juventus, he said, um, 
you know, Ancelotti then, because, you know, he said he really liked you, would have taken you then to AC Milan. You would have won two European Cups. So I was like, thanks for telling me. I really appreciate that. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. You did end up with a lot of Italians in che- at Chelsea and West London. So you sort of had a half Italian experience. Yeah, yeah, very much. So. Chelsea is sort of the, the London, Italy. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, little little Italy in London. You're 100 percent right, and uh, that that was it. That was obviously Gianfranco Zola was there, Claudio or Mister as we used to call him, uh, and his staff. That that was, it was a really good experience working with them. Yeah, and uh, the, the goalkeeper coach was the best goalkeeping coach that I had in all my time uh, playing uh, in the UK, Giorgio Pellizzaro. I don't know if he's still alive, any, but he was he was not only a great character, but he was a superb coach. And uh, and uh, it was a learning experience. I I think I, I felt really sorry for uh, Miss, uh, well, for uh, for Claudia because English what you know his English then wasn't as good as it is now, and I think that's so important that a coach you know needs to communicate with his players. And you got to also remember as well, although Chelsea was pretty much a foreign team, there were still the core players of English players, and some of his ways and the way of doing things was even though they're now you know, familiar with everyone. It was still cha- help changing the culture. You know, people had seen what Arsene Wenger had done it to Arsenal, and, uh, and 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 it was just sort of you know still trying to change that type of culture. But I saw the makings, and I remember before he went to Leicester and had that amazing title win. And somebody actually asked me on radio, you know, how do you think you do? And I thought there was just the right timing then uh, because you could see the makings of it back then. And uh, obviously, the more and more he'd become familiar with the league, the more and more comfortable he would be. And the more foreign players that came in. And let's not forget as well, like I said, for me, the Premier League is coming up to its 30th anniversary. And uh, without the foreign influences from people from all around the world, it would not be what it is today. Can I just ask this question? Do you really believe that Claudio Ranieri laid the solid foundations that led Jose Mourinho to do so well? Did you enjoy him as a coach? Yeah, I, I did. I did. I, 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 I think the big turning point was Roman Abramovich. That uh, I think that that was the massive turning point. But um, I, I'm with you in terms of uh, you know laying down laying down certain foundations. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Look, and, and some managers are really good at that. And then you know then there's other managers who need to come in to be the icing on the cake. Um, but I think the biggest foundations were, were laid. Like I said, I think as soon as Roman Abramovich came in, it was quite clear. Where they where they wanted to go and what they wanted to be, um, but there's there's no doubt that um, Ranieri brought a certain type of class, a certain type of dignity, and a certain type of stability as much as you're going to see at Chelsea, uh, because you know since Abramovich has come in, they've had more managers than anyone, but domestically they've won more trophies than anyone, so you can't really argue with with the way that, uh, that he goes about things. But there's no doubt about that. Um, like I said, to you, a very dignified man. Um, you know, had his own ways. And it was good because remember at that time as well, you know, around 1999, 2000, Serie A was still the, the benchmark in terms of leagues around the world. Um, so it was good to get somebody of his experience. Did you did you use this this famous story with the bell and Ranieri, the dilly ding, dilly dong bell? I'm, I'm a bit obsessed with it because I remember <laughs> hearing about that from players. Yeah. Um, his Italy, this, I, he had his little bell that when, when people weren't working hard enough, is that was that a thing he used with you guys? No, he, he used to say that term was I remember, but I think that was mainly because of his his English wasn't you know wasn't great. So you know if he wanted to wake everyone up, he used to use that term, but he never had the bell. Yeah? <laughs> he never had the bell. Actually, he was quite. It was funny because he was one oh, of uh, you know I can remember uh, specifically playing at Derby so once. Upset. Was, yeah, playing at Derby once, and uh, we we're losing one nil at half time, and 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 it wasn't going particularly well. So coming out of you know the dressing room at Manchester United, if that was happening. So Alex would come in and by the time you come into the dressing room, he'd already be screaming at someone, you know? Um, but but uh, Mr. Ranieri back then anyway, was complete opposite. You know, people were arguing all that. He just wanted complete silence for everyone to relax for about two or three minutes before he calmly put across exactly what, you know, what he wanted us to do. And, you know, to be fair, that day anyway, it worked. And we came back, it was it was 1-1. Um, but that was the contrasting styles. Like I said, you know, everyone's different the way they go about things. But that was more him. But definitely at training, it was, you know, like I said, dilly dee, dilly dong, you know, but he never had the actual, the bell in his hand, but he would actually say that, you know, come on, come on, come on, you know. 
that's that's wonderful. <laughs> I actually love that story as well. That he would insist on some moment of quiet before the start. <laughs> I, I actually that's I, that's sort of insight. I love I love hearing that stuff because different managers have different yeah. ways of doing that, but it it fits yeah. with this idea I have of him in my head. Yeah. No, no, he may have changed now, but that was definitely him back then, put it that way. The other thing I, I, I'll always remember is that pre-seasons at a place called Rocco Perena. I think it was about two or three hours south of Rome. He used to take us in the mountains. The, the, the population of the town, I reckon, was about 50. Um, but those pre-seasons were absolutely fantastic. You never feel, felt fitter or, or more healthier going to those pre-seasons. I love this conversation, and I'm sad <laughs> to bring it to an end but it is half past midnight here in the UK so we half past midnight sorry half past 11 but it feels like half past midnight because we just changed the clocks backwards so <laughs> so we're going to we're going to have to to call it um time with uh, with you here tonight um mark thank you so much for coming on and maybe we'll talk to you again sometime in the future but it's been a pleasure having you yeah it really has thank you so much for joining us see you soon nikki thank you so much and thank you, and Mina as well. Really, really appreciate it. There was a huge game on Sunday night, Mina. Roma Milan on Sunday night this week lived up to my hopes for a real entertaining game. It got started off I thought at a great pace both teams playing ambitious uh, attacking football I think both teams came at it with intent I thought Milan were better and deserved to take the lead um they end up going 2-0 ahead and then they get a red card and then you have this um Milan uh, sorry Roma appeal for a penalty at the end of the game and you have Mourinho going crazy it had all the ingredients of a good entertaining Sunday night in Serie A, including Zlatan Ibrahimovic doing Zlatan Ibrahimovic things. I mean, Roma literally did that thing where you lie a man down behind the walls that you can't score a free <laughs> kick under the wall. He just did it anyway. He just did it anyway. Here's the thing. It, it, we're recording this, guys. If you if you do wonder why sometimes it just seems like we're about to pass out, it's because we're recording this after the match. <laughs> and we are somewhat shattered because it is one of those games that I feel like today I have watched 4,000 games. It started off with, obviously, Inter against Udinese. And then there was Fiorentina. And then there was Napoli. And now it was like the, the culmination of all of it ending in Roma versus, um, obviously, Milan, which was the biggest game. And yes, you're right, Nikki, like you mentioned, it had all of the things that we would want from a match, and I think deservedly so, Milan won. Um, I do think perhaps Karlsdorp could have been sent off, so I feel I feel like Roma were lucky to um, have escaped that. Um, also, perhaps, I don't, I mean, here's the, at the end of the game, he said, if I say anything more, I would like more respect for Roma fans, because if I say anything else, I won't be on the touchline next week. He was absolutely furious, totally stormed off, didn't feel that the referee really gave them any chances. Um, at the end of the day, I thought Roma came out of the traps doing so well. And, and frankly speaking, for this season, I have been somewhat of a Roma fan. And I so enjoyed a lot of their games in the beginning, from especially the one against Fiorentina. There's just been so many exciting matches. I know that obviously Milan went down to 10 men and you think, oh, this is a great opportunity for us to try to come back and score two goals and potentially win because this ended a 43 game winning streak for Mourinho at home. And while they did throw everything, at the, uh, including the kitchen sink, I would like more opportunities for players like Shmuradov. I want to see his potential there. I'm not entirely sure the speed of execution required from Tammy Abraham is there. I don't think he's yet understanding everything that's going on in the team. So you feel like sometimes he takes a second to to do what it is that he wants to do. And by then everyone's in their position. So I think Tammy just needs a little bit more time, but I would like others to be included. And I want to see more because this was, you know, this was a kind of game that was 3-3 and then 2-1 in, in last year under Fonseca. So I'm rightfully, people will ask, are Roma improving in these big matches? Well, I, I I totally agree with you about Shamorodov. Just to say off the bat, that's a player who they spent nearly twenty million euros on in the summer, and I had all these 
great headlines I saw about the Uzbek Messi, which of course, you know, you know that when people are doing that, they're being a bit ridiculous. But nevertheless, you're excited to see it. And actually, I think he's looked not bad. And then he's played a yeah. total of like 160 odd minutes across nine games. So really good coming on in these situations for 10 minutes, the end of games. And I, I don't know why, because he's not, he's not one of the ones who's on Mourinho's list, right? So Mourinho has told us now that there are 13 or 14 players who are good enough to play for Roma. And I, he hasn't excluded Shimoda from the group. So I'm guessing that that's one of those players, but he doesn't seem to want to actually put him on the pitch very much. And there's, there's two different things going on here, right? The first of which is player for player now. I have no problem saying that Milan are a better team than Roma. When I look at those two teams now, um, when I look at Ibra and Leao, the goal they had disallowed where they combined, and it was just, it's just vibes with this attack. I absolutely love it. They are just so, first of all, good. And secondly, feeling it. Like that goal was just the one that was disallowed with everything. Because you have Ibra doing the, the chest down swagger and you have Leao chipping the keeper and then bringing it down and going like, yeah. Like both of them just out <laughs> the there with swagger. And player for player, I look at that and I'm like, well, these are more talented footballers than, 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 than Roma have. Roma have some some really talented players. They've got a couple. They've got Pellegrini, who's brilliant. Of course, Sagnolo, who I think Sagnolo's good. I sometimes wonder with Zaniolo if we've overhyped him a little bit, including myself in, in that conversation. I I, I I'm not certain that I see when I really look at him, I'm like, is he with the Barellas, the Pellegrinis, the that group of players? I think he's got a lot to show still. But yeah, you go through that midfield and yes, Kessie and Benessa, who we've loved for ages, and Tonali coming off the bench when you need him. Calabria, fullback. Brahim Diaz, Teo Hernandez. I mean, Teo Hernandez got sent off in the stupidest way possible. But, well, actually, that's not true. There are stupider ways, but it was a really obvious um, way to get yourself sent off. And player for player, they're better. But I also am just struggling. And I'm almost wary of saying it because last time on this show, I, I had a little go at Mourinho and I had people coming after me for having a go at Mourinho. And apparently we're still even after all this time, have, have a, a, a group who are very determined not to hear him slighted. But I just don't know what he does for this football team other than the grinta, other than the passion, other than getting these players and getting them worked up and telling them this is so important. And some of those players really buy in, by the way. I think Pellegrini is all in on Mourinho. But tactically, making more of what you've got I don't, I don't see it, Mina. I don't know if you're seeing something there that I'm not. No, I mean, we, we rightfully called the season as the battle of the coaches. I mean, this was something that everyone has said. Every broadcaster from America to Australia to Italy said this is the season yeah. of the coaches. And we see, for example, when we watch Inter, we, I mean, I've said lots of things about Simone Inzaghi and his substitutions, but I love the way that team attacks, the unpredictability, the, the, that they, you just don't know where it's going to come from. It's either Jeco's brilliance or it's, you know, Perisic just doing everything. There's just so many things going on at the same time that you, when you think of them last season and they were perhaps more balanced and extremely winning, now, at least on an offensive level, I think they're so fun to watch. When you watch Stefano Pioli's Milan, there's so much going on. You don't know whether it's Leao or Samakas or Castillejo or Brahim Diaz or, or Teo Hernandez and Calabria, you know, mixing and matching and developing something. On an offensive level, there is a lot to admire by, you know, in Milan, in Napoli. But when it comes to Juve and, and Roma, I feel like they're a little bit similar in the sense that you know, I, I mean, Allegri's probably jealous of the Grinta that Roma's showing, <laughs> but I'm not sure there are any clear strategies going forward. And this is, you know, something that's interesting because, you know, like um, Mark had pointed out that, you know, when you do have great players, you sort of leave it up to them to create something up front. But I'm not sure the, these are players that don't need a little bit more coaching and and a little bit more ideas because I do think they're sort of dependent on Pellegrini. Even midweek when they were against Cagliari, their goals came from set pieces. I'm not seeing these clear offensive strategies from open play. 
And it's kind of all a little bit reminiscent of, you know, Manchester United, right? They're a counter-attacking team. But what happens when you're not counter-attacking? What happens for Juventus when they're not counter-attacking? And they actually have to find a way through, through all the stodge, through all the all the defending, all the great midfielders that are holding it all together, like Ben Esser did today. And, and what a luxury to bring on Tonali afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I mean when I say about the quality. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You're right about that. If you can bring Tonali off the board, it's, outra- it's outrageous. He's so good this season. Oh, here's the thing. Milan were really good last season. And you just, you found Roma really suffering at home. But then I thought what Fonseca did at the time was amazing. He lowered Pellegrini, made them a 5-3-2, gave them defensive security so that they could actually push on in terms of their center of gravity. I don't know whether these tactical adjustments are being made right now. And I don't know whether it's still the beginning, so I don't want to ask for too much from Mourinho and, and he needs time. But I would have liked somebody to control the ball, you know, the, the velvet feet that they like to describe Roma last season. Your Villas and combining with Pellegrinis and everyone's just de- developing play and it's all so creative and beautiful. Yes, they didn't have Grinta, but there was something to watch that... Sometimes I feel like they might have lost that in their hopes of being this warrior-like team. And I wonder, it wouldn't it be nice to have both Fonseca and Mourinho on the sidelines? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I should say that in the end, all that passion, all that green day, all that hard work, I, I actually think it, it very possibly even should have got them a draw because I, I feel like some of what went on in the box at the end of that game in injury time looked about as much a penalty as as the penalty that Milan got I, not that the yeah I agree not that I'm trying to say that the Milan penalty wasn't I just think it was it was on the edge a little bit it was it was a yeah there's there's some contact there and, and if if this gets given I'm okay with it and if it doesn't get given I might also be okay with it and I think that some of what went on with Bakayoko in the box it, it felt to me like a penalty this is the interesting thing about recording and uh, now it's the first time we've done this podcast we recorded after the games on Sunday instead of doing it on Monday so I haven't had a chance to take in the Mourinho reaction yet. I'm guessing from what I saw of Mourinho's reaction on the sideline during the game <laughs> that probably he's not enthusiastic about the refereeing. Um, there were certainly some indications of that during the game. And and, and I actually, I will say that on this occasion, I, I could I could show some sympathy for that. I think they were, um, they were unlucky in some of those big decisions, actually. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. And, and certainly that, that competitive fury, if they had got a point, would have been the reason. They they threw everything, including the kitchen sink, into that Milan um, penalty area at the end, and it, it nearly did work. Yes, but I, I am also going to just say one thing. Calabria is the best fallback in Italy. <laughs> I, well, I, do you know what? I, the problem with this show, this show is mean, and I agree. I think I agree with you right now. For Italian fullbacks, I, I don't know who I'd, I'd have ahead of him. So I can't make this into a controversial argument because I agree with you. Damn it. It's always much more fun when we get to argue. And Nikki, <laughs> but these days well, we're just agreeing on everything. <laughs> I know. I know. I thought I'd, earlier I thought I could get you into reaction on Allegri, but you, you agreed with me even on that when I started saying it was his yes. fault. So do you know what? I've got an idea. Why don't we... See if we can get a special someone on next week who we always disagree with. I'll keep that one as a teaser for our for our audience. My heart's already uh, skipping. <laughs> I know I'm going to be in for a lot of uh, anguish next week, so I'm going to sleep a lot before that. <laughs> I think it's astonishing what what Milan are doing. Um, I feel like you know to to really force home this point. I just want to say. While I'm here saying I think Milan have the more talented team, it's not actually like all of these players have been bought for more money than the players Roma have just been spend- buying this summer. The reason they have a more talented team is because they've got a coach who keeps getting the most out of all these players. And so Stefano Pioli remains at the top of my current today Serie A managerial power rankings. It doesn't mean he's there forever, but right now I think he's doing the best job in Italian football. I am still like desperate to see more of Roma. I enjoy so much of what they're doing right now, but I am a little bit actually quite disappointed in Shmuradov not playing because he is one of my favorite players. And there's so much of him that I admired in preseason and everyone spoke so highly of all the work that he does in the front line. So to be given 158 minutes in Serie A, it breaks my heart. And I, and Borja Mayoral was 
considered, you know, the, the hero last season. And Villar and his dribbling and ability to possess the ball, I just wish the squad was used more. That's all. Just quickly, you were not impressed with Napoli. They won again. I just want to bring up something, Mina, because here I'm going to pick a fight with you since we don't pick enough fights with each other. Mina, Napoli, who are top of the table, yes, Victor Osimhen is incredible. But they have conceded three goals in 11 games. Nobody mm. else in Serie A has conceded fewer than 10. So they are that much better defensively than everyone in the division so far. Three goals conceded. The next closest is 10. So I should love Napoli is your point, yeah? That's what I'm saying, yes. I'm saying oh, you right. should okay. change your mind. <laughs> and that actually, because you've in the past said that you like defensive football, you actually should love this. No, I appreciate <laughs> coaches who do what they have to do with what they have. So I like a pragmatic coach. I like a guy who does what he's supposed to do with what he has available. And frankly speaking, it's very difficult for me to try to decide between Pioni and Spalletti because in terms of actual coaching, or rather tactics, I'm in love with both of them. Maybe Spalletti is just a little bit better in terms of tactics, but in terms of of overall coaching, I would say Pioli is better maybe, you know. And I think, yes, I, I love that he managed to pair Ramani with Koulibaly. I love that Anguissa is just the world's greatest midfielder at the moment, you know. And when you have awesome and everything becomes easy because he resolves every situation. But today against Salernitana, unless it was 5-0, I'm just like, what's happening? You know, like, why is this not 5-0? It's Salernitana, for goodness sakes, yeah. And yes, it's they the put the, the show of their it's lives. The huh? It's the derby. Yes, the local it's rivals. the derby. You're yeah. right. But do you really think that the, all these players were feeling that? <laughs> like, you know, do you, do you really think that, like, you know, like, Chucky Lozano is on there going, oh, I feel the pressure. <laughs> no, I just, you know. <laughs> I guess yesterday I was a little bit disappointed in them, to be honest with you. I wanted them to be like a 5 nil victory. I wanted to enjoy myself. And I enjoy myself a little bit more watching Milan play because I like tactical games and and that's how a good defense is maintained whereas sometimes I think with Napoli it's based a lot on their individuals doing the right things Anguissa, Koulibaly, Rahmani. I'm gonna also say that I think any manager who can keep eight clean sheets in 11 games while Mario Rui is a fullback <laughs> deserves a lot of credit as well. <laughs> that is a great point Nikki. He's not a bad defender but he's just a defender who you I mean 11 games that's enough time for at least four or five really erratic moments in Mario Rui so I think you've done well to not concede in some of those games so just to quickly glance the table let's look at the table Napoli and Milan both on 31 points from 11 games which is outrageous by the way that's like something that's barely ever happened in, in Italian in Serie A I think there's maybe two teams that have done that before Juventus as we mentioned is 16 points back but even just the gap from those two to third place in Inter is seven points. Inter did win this weekend. They beat Udinese 2-0. A couple of goals from Joaquin Correa. Is this a two-horse race, Mina, or is it a three-horse race? Or is it more horses in the race that I'm not naming? I think to actually win the title, it's a three-horse race. Um, just for the simple sakes that well, Milan and, and Napoli have won so much now that they have to be included in it. And also... I don't see where they're going to drop points. <laughs> like, I'm starting to worry, yeah. Here's the thing with Inter. I think that, like, I'm starting to like them a little bit more every game. And I'm especially liking the fact that, for example, with them, they do have all these offensive schemes, so much unpredictability, so many great players that, like, Sanchez came in midweek, Alexis Sanchez, and I think he did a really great job, you know. You've got Lataro Martinez. You've got Xhaka, who is outscoring Lukaku. Um, and... You know, there's just so much talent up front and so many different ways of scoring goals for them. You know, a, a great midfield and now a great defense. I mean, two clean sheets in a row. They dominated possession um, against Udinese. And and I just feel like now we're starting to see the work of, you know, Inzaghi's right-hand man in, in Massimiliano Faris, who is who is a man who is from Milan, incidentally, and has worked with Inzaghi for a long time. But he's excellent when it comes to defensive tactics and trying to organize things, which is what allowed Lazio to be so much fun going forward, but still quite not without taking too many risks at the back. Um, and I thought that he helped in making Francesco Cervi one of the best centre-backs in Italy at the time. 
and obviously De Vry and, and, and he's worked with these players. So I... I love Inter and I don't think you can discount them. And I think they'll keep growing, especially now that they found a little bit more balance, perhaps something that they didn't have at the start of this game. And you never know because they are not dependent on anyone. So while Milan will lose players in the Africa Cup of Nations and so will Napoli, who who are Inter going to lose, right? I also sort of really loved uh, in midweek. I forgot who they played midweek. Is it Empoli? Empoli. Yeah. yeah. And Danny, Danilo D'Ambrosio, who's like literally the world's greatest club man, right, um, comes on, does a sublime job for the team, as he always does, because I just feel like he's like, he's got into burned into his soul, you know, and scores and then goes and celebrates with Dumfries. And I don't know why, but that really just oh, made me that feel... Was a nice moment. Yeah, that made me feel like that if you a nice have moment. a good team that loves each other and there's great dressing room harmony which is something that hasn't been associated with Inter I mean it has been really recently but not before that but seeing that point. makes me think yeah like this is a happy team and you know Inter was always a team that you know I remember Icardi like challenging the fans and all this mess in the background and Nangolan angry and you know they, they've had moments where I've just felt like it's always been a little bit of mess in, in the dressing room but now I see a really happy team and one that everyone is is really genuinely like working together, happy to be together. No one's upset. Perisic gives his life out there, you know, and I, I love that about them. So it makes me a mini Inter supporter. I'm like the worst Juve fan, by the way. <laughs> I'm like challenged. I'm like, yeah, I love Roma, you know, oh, I want Milan goodness. if there's any justice. <laughs> and so I don't know, but they are for yeah. me a much more lovable team now. That I, I think it's a great point that I really hadn't thought about is, you know, I remember having these conversations with you, Mina, like about is there a, a an Argentinian camp and a Balkan camp and yeah, an Italian camp within that interdressing room and they all just like each other. That was the, the reports for so long. And now that's gone. And you're right, that Dumfries moment was lovely. And when you think, actually, if it wasn't for a late and hotly debated even though I think it was the right decision penalty in the Derby Italia a week ago Inter would be still pretty close on the heels of those leaders so they are doing not too shabby at all it's just that the pace that's being set by those front two at the moment is absolutely bonkers to be honest have to give a shout out to Chiro Immobile Pulling level Yay. with Silvio Piola as Lazio's all-time leading goal scorer. That is definitely quite something. And obviously, he's going to go past him very, very soon. I am a little bit worried about Atalanta's form at home, especially now that United is coming to visit them. They seem to be better away from home. They've only managed one win. Meanwhile, Lazio looked like a team that could only do anything at home. So good for them that they managed to score two goals against Atalanta. And really, probably... Well, actually, no, not probably because Atlanta were very strong at the end. But great game. That was, yeah, a lot of fun. I, I just want to see which identity Lazio settle in in the end or whether they're just going to be this confused going forward where one week they're dull and one week they're super fun. <laughs> and also, which worth mentioning that Lazio goalkeeper Pepe Arena was hit by a coin and now Atlanta could be sanctioned with a fine and a match behind closed doors. But here's the thing. He was also hit with adhesive tape. And I'm just wondering, these people, oh, these gosh. fans that go into stadiums, yeah, where did you get the <laughs> adhesive tape from? Like, I don't understand, you know? Like, you just decide to, like, and there's a stapler in there and a couple of post-it notes and some adhesive tape. Well, I, I always remember, I always remember, this was a very indicative experience I had as a teenager. My school I went to did a um, a school exchange um, with a school in Italy, so we went uh, to Bologna for a week oh. and it was it was lovely um I mean I, I already got to go to Bologna a lot because my dad is from the countryside nearish to Bologna so we, we often flew in there so I already knew it quite well but why not it was fun um and we went to Bologna game as part of the exchange they took us to a football game and I remember there was a boy in my class who had as was the trend had um car keys with like his wallet on a chain and, oh yes, yeah. and the security insisted on taking the chain off him, like wouldn't let him keep it, took it off him. And then we got inside, and as is very common in Italian football stadiums, there were flares and there were fireworks. And he was there going, "How has this happened? Like that's just literally the chain <laughs> of my wallet, and they've got explosives in." And look, that's the reality of of um, 
the ultras. It was a motorcycle throne. Football stadiums. Yeah, the, the ultras have connections that let them do things that they shouldn't do is the answer to that question, basically. But I remember him being very put out. Teenage, poor teenager. He said his <laughs> stuff taken off him. But yes, that's the answer, you know. If you're in the right groups, you can get most anything in. I don't know why you've brought an adhesive tape, but some of the modern stadiums like Juventus stadiums are, are probably doing a better job of keeping some bad stuff out. But um, yeah, a lot of Italian stadiums, there's a lot of people getting in things they shouldn't. Okay, guys, I think that's pretty much all we have time for. This is like, you know, the second time I, uh, I try to do my outro because I was wanting to say that we didn't get to talk about Torino. And then everyone's just started, you know, that producer came in and Nikki was like, I know I'm tired. And, and we didn't get a chance to do this. It's night. <laughs> it is. It is. It's very late. I mean, it's really half past one, to be honest with you, because our clocks just went yeah. back and our bodies haven't adjusted. But it is a jam-packed show, and you'll be really also thrilled with who we have next season. Next, season. next week, um, purely because everyone likes to look at my face and my anger, so I'm sure that gives it away. But um, thank you so much to our guest this week, Mark Bosnich, and our and our listeners, and especially those Australian listeners, can find him at Stan Sports Australia's UEFA comms coverage, and his Twitter handle is at the real Bozza. So definitely look him up. Um, always a pleasure to hear him and his uh, takes on things. Oh, so nice to hear everything he had to say as a footballer. But we'll be back on Friday with Chronicles Q&A Mailbag Show. Get your questions into us on Twitter at SeriaCronPod with the hashtag Chronicles Q&A. Find us on Twitter at Nikki Bandini or at Mina Rizuki. And make sure you follow the pod's social media content throughout the week. All the links for Serie A Chronicle social media will be in the show notes. We love the interaction with our listeners. Leave us a rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Obviously, you know what to do if you don't have anything nice to say. <laughs> Consider supporting the show at seriachronicles.com forward slash supporter. We love having you listening to us and we love doing the show with you. So that's all we have for this week. Ciao for now. Vediamo naturalmente che venga battuto questo calcio di punizione. Piede sulla palla, la specie, parte il tiro. Rete! Rete! Maradona ha segnato. Magnifico calcio di punizione da parte della formazione napoletana. Il Napoli è passato in vantaggio proprio a circa 27-28 minuti dall'inizio del secondo tempo e conduce così per una rete a zero. Eh, ma quando ha segnato questo gol alla Juventus, che è andato verso il suo pubblico napoletano, cosa ha pensato? Che colore è il gol? <ride> eh, il, il gol sì, il colore è assurdo, è assurdo per, per tutta la gente di Napoli. È finita, ha vinto il Napoli e ha raggiunto così il sogno che indubbiamente hanno cullato giocatori e tifosi per tutta una settimana. Sport Social Podcast Network. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.